tonight on Icon's Radio Hour. We present an interview with actress Jean Simmons. Among her best-known leading roles are Guys and Dolls opposite Marlon Brando, Elmer Gantry with Burt Lancaster, and Spartacus starring opposite Kirk Douglas. Join us for the next hour as we explore Jean Simmons' extraordinary career as she discusses her co-stars, directors, and films with her singular warmth, intelligence, and sharp British wit. The Big Country is the story of the giants who conquered the untamed land. Power packed with a huge star cast. Gregory Peck as the stranger who came to the big country to tame a sea of sun, sand, and violence. Gene Simmons as the girl who stood proud and alone. Spartacus, a motion picture unequaled in the entire history of filmmaking. Unlikely ever to be surpassed. Starring Kirk Douglas as Spartacus. Slave, gladiator, invincible fighter. Lawrence Olivier as Crassus, symbol of Rome's majesty and might. I'm not after glory. I'm after Spartacus. Gene Simmons as the slave Arinia, whose body was bought and sold, but whose love enveloped Spartacus with a radiance few men have known. And he got fury of you. Marlon Brando never danced or sang a note in his life until he met Golden. But he sings and he dances and guys and dolls and he'll fracture you. Gene Simmons, too, is a dramatic star, not a singer. But as Sister Sarah of the Mission Doll, she's adorable and her singing voice is terrific. Together, these two generate excitement that's electric. Let me show you what I mean. Would you be open to a proposition? I've had those, no. Don't flatter yourself, I'm talking business. I am in a position to supply you with the raw material you need for your work, namely sinners. How? You're listening to Icon's Radio Hour, presented by Moda Entertainment. Each week, Icon's Radio Hour features exclusive interviews with those who know classic Hollywood the best. Actors and directors, producers and writers, colleagues and family. Icon's Radio Hour. Insightful, entertaining, and definitely unique. And now, here are your hosts, Stephen Bogart and John Mulholland. And welcome to Icons Radio, listeners. Uh, Tonight, uh, we will be talking to a great lady, a wonderful actress, and one of the most respected women in Hollywood who's ever been in Hollywood, and that would be Gene Simmons. Um, She has worked in some of the finest films of all time, The Great Expectations with David Lean directing, Uh, the quintessential Hamlet with uh, Larry Olivier, she played Ophelia, The Robe with Richard Burton, Guys and Dolls, uh, one of my favorite movies, The Big Country, one of the greatest westerns ever made, Uh, Elmer Gantry, Spartacus, it goes on and on. Uh, She's one of the most respected women that uh, Hollywood uh, has ever produced. Uh, Of course, Hollywood didn't produce you, Gene, (laughs) you're British, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Oh, thank you very much. I, I don't know what to say after that, that lovely introduction. Oh, I really appreciate that. I, I, well, my, my one question for you is, are you still the girl from Cricklewood? Oh, well, yes, sort of, yes. I'm sure. What you know, did... uh, uh, slightly older, but, uh, but still the girl from Cricklewood, I think. Um, I, I don't think I've become what you, is known as a Hollywood, uh, I don't know. No, I don't. I don't think you have have either. And I think that your dad. Would... Larry used to say to me that he said, "Well, you're you're going to be. It'll be better if you're international, whatever that means. Can be understood in both countries." <laughs> That's true. Well, you know, you started out. You're only 14 years old, Jean, and and yes. your first. You know, I, I know it was a it was a while ago for all of us. But uh, in Give Us the Moon, directed by Val Guest, who incidentally John will be talking about later, who ended up doing the quarter mass experiment. How did you end up getting the part in Give Us the Moon at age 14? Well, um, I went to dancing school, the Ada Foster Dancing School, where little girls who want to go in England, you know, have their dancing lessons. And I was there for about, going about two weeks. 
and suddenly Mrs. Foster said to me, um, I want you to come um, just to see, to see a gentleman that um, wants you to read for him. I thought, oh, that sounds fun. I didn't know anything about movies or, or well, at least to see them, yes. Anyway, off I went and uh, I read some lines, something I had to say, something about a bloated capitalist, didn't know what that was. And uh, <laughs> all of a sudden I'm in a movie. I mean, it was extraordinary. Um, I, um, you know, and I got five pounds a day <laughs> and uh, just, you know, had a, a glorious time. I thought it was fun, but I didn't take it seriously then as a, as a, career, a career. I was going to be a dentist assistant, I think, at some point. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was all kind of a mad, mad sort of crazy world for uh, about 30 days. And then after you and did it... And then went back to school. But but you were in a couple of other things since then. You know, you were in uh, Mr. Emmanuel and Kiss the Bride Goodbye. And eventually... Oh, you've got a list something. Oh, yeah, we've got the list. Don't worry about that. Because <laughs> I don't remember some of them. Absolutely. Yeah, yes, I did a couple of sort of bits and pieces. And, uh, and then when I was auditioned for Young Estella for David Lean, I got that uh, role and I suddenly thought, oh... I think this is what I really would like to do. I got the bug, so to speak. You know, my mother had the bug. She was a model, and, and you know... Yes, you, I know. I'm and you know my mom, and, and, you know, she was a model. She got out there, she started acting, she met my father. And Once you get the bug, you get the bug, and you can't you get, get rid of bug, it. You get the bug, yes. And before that, yes. before Great Expectations, you did Caesar and Cleopatra. I played a harpist. Yes. Oh, Lord, I had to ride a camel. <laughs> and how was and, that? It was the most dreadful experience, really. Uh, well, we were shooting outside, but it was a street scene, and they'd built a, a huge kind of, well, not a huge, but a small hill. And we had to start at the, stop, at the top of the hill. And the, the camel got very upset and uh, bit the camel driver and backed off with me on it and the harp. <laughs> uh, which wasn't funny, actually. Oh, I'm sorry for laughing. They, they, it was humiliating, and uh, the next day they put me on a donkey, so um, <laughs> it was the last of my camel riding experience. And then that was when you met Stuart Granger, too, your first husband. Um, I met him, but uh, that was, um, yes, of course, he was playing um, Apollodorus in, in the film, but uh, that, that didn't mean anything. I was just a kid then. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you're bringing back memories I thought I'd sort of forgotten. Jean, uh, in working in Great Expectations, do you have any uh, anecdotes or memories of David Lean, what he was like as a director? Oh, he was absolutely wonderful. He was very kind to me. He could, apparently, I've heard much later that he could be quite tough, but, uh, but and a very patient, patient man. But uh, I was just in, in heaven, you know, working with him. He was so sweet to me. And um, and was very concerned when I set myself on fire. So, <laughs> the, the, the candle that I carried around, and, and one day we were going up and down stairs, and I was so tired, and uh, I just let the candle drop, and um, suddenly the apron was totally in flames. And uh, the young boy, Tony Wager, who played Pip, came, rushed forward, and just yanked it off me and saved me from getting a rather nasty burn. Oh, my goodness. After that horrifying uh, uh, incident, you then uh, did a movie called Black Narcissus uh, with my, uh, Deborah Carr and Michael Powell directing. Yes. What was Michael Powell like? Well, uh, you know, he seemed uh, very pleased with this uh, strange creature that I had to play uh, with a ring in her nose <laughs> that kept falling out every time I smiled. But, um, no, he, he, he was... You know, the little experience I had, uh, it was wonderful. And, and you had to play a black woman in the movie, right? Yes, uh, an Indian. It's so interesting because because we had interviewed uh, Gail Buckley uh, the other day, uh, and we talked Lena to her about, about Lena, Lena Horne's daughter and about the stuff that she had to go through and how sometimes they had to whiten her face in order to play uh, a, a white woman in a movie so she wouldn't be so black. I don't know, I didn't understand all that, but um, then, you know, in those days, uh, it was very difficult for, for uh, black people, I think, to um, work in movies for some um, God knows reason. I remember when we talked to Lena, uh, she, they used to shoot separate scenes so they could cut her out when they showed the scenes in the South. Uh, oh, good and Lord. She stood oh, fast. and, and she I remember seeing her at uh, this uh, uh, nightclub somewhere, 
And even then, I mean, we're talking uh, like uh, 40, 50 years ago, uh, she had to come in through the kitchen. She, <laughs> she wasn't um, allowed to come in the front way. That's just, and, uh, you know, she how... I could not believe. And then there were all these uh, people sitting in the audience absolutely adoring her, and, and mostly white people, and um, absolutely loving her, and she was brilliant. And After that, Jean, and I, I really want to talk about this, I'm sure John does too, uh, uh, one of the great performances in the history of film uh, was, of course, uh, Larry Olivier in uh, in Hamlet. Oh yes. And uh, you got to play Ophelia opposite him. Uh, I should add that 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 Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee worked together in that film the first time they'd worked together ever. Yes. But uh, what was it like uh, playing opposite Larry Olivier? Oh, um, of course, I was absolutely. Um the basket case but he was very very kind the only thing I, I really got, got a bawling out for was he kept me late at the studio which was way outside of London but I was he was sending me to see some uh, a theatre production of, of his in London and it was one of those uh, awful foggy days the, you know, the pea supers we called them and it took me a long time anyway I had to rip my wig off and get my makeup off and blah 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 and tried to get into London on time and I was 10 minutes late for the curtain and uh, the next day he bawled me out in front of the entire crew about never being late how dare you go to the theater and be late how dare you keep actors waiting and and, uh, blah, blah, and on and on and on of course I was in tears and um, then he said I said I hope that will be a lesson to you do not keep the crew of, of the film, of which I had never had done, uh, just to, to, to be on time and, and don't keep the people waiting. It's terribly rude. And uh, floods of tears. And uh, anyway, then he came over and gave me a big hug, and he said, uh, "That's a very good lesson to learn." Now, you know, uh, he, he was. Uh, you know, I, I had met him a couple of times. Is that you know, my mom was very good friends with him. Um, yes. And, and and how how did he help you in your craft? Because you were still only eighteen years old, and you'd just gotten in the into the movies. He got he got me the most wonderful coach. Never forget her name, Molly Touraine. And I worked with her on the on the long uh, soliloquies, and um, she was wonderful. And and he knew exactly what Larry wanted, because she'd worked with him before, you know, helping people and. Uh, and then Larry, with his guidance and patience on the set with me, he was just, uh, it was just wonderful. And also I found out that he was a terrible giggler, which is, <laughs> which is, is a wonderful thing to, for another actor to find out <laughs> about somebody that you think is just, you know, you had such a crush on him anyway. <laughs> that, um, and to find out that he had to giggle sometimes in the middle of the scene uh, was, a, was a wonderful thing to find out. <laughs> for me, anyway, because I'm a terrible giggler. Uh, Jean, when, when Olivier uh, um, y was yelling at you, did anyone on the set step forward and say, uh, this isn't necessary or something? No, no. Really? Not that I know of. No, 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 of course not, because, uh, you know, he was Lawrence Olivier. He'd just been knighted, too. He did, it was right, and I, it was a lesson I learned for the rest of my, my career. Uh, and everything else in my life. If I have to catch an aeroplane, I'm not two hours early as to go to um, the airport, but I'm three hours early. Oh, you and me both. Okay. Uh, oh, these mm. days, that's understandable. I'm exactly the same way, Jean. I, I have you? to get, oh, I have to get everywhere I early. I that was your mom's training, too. Well, I, I would say yes. I would say it's my mom's training, although she, she is a lot of times late, but she, uh, made sure that we understood that you can't keep people waiting and, and they have jobs to do and one of yes. your jobs is to be there on time yes so and, and I, I have another question about did you and i don't know how you can answer this so so don't worry if you can't probably get dead silent <laughs> that's okay too but larry uh, larry directed himself in the film um, was that a different dynamic for you, uh, as opposed well, to having... Uh, no, obviously he'd played uh, Hamlet many, many times on stage. He, uh, there was another actor on the stage that he admired, and he would watch Larry from the camera, and he might, you know, say something or a little something to him, but um, uh, he was covered in that sense 
that uh, he could forget about directing when he was acting and there was you know this other actor I wish I Anthony Bushell I think his name was uh, that would say um, you know this is could be a little better that could be less or whatever it's interesting that a guy of his talent would be able to entrust his film and his acting to someone else. I find that, I find that well, incredible. It was just, I mean, he knew exactly what he wanted, what he was doing. But uh, it's just that, you know, uh, sometimes in, in a take, you, you know, you, there's something that you might know that you can do it better, you know? I mean, he was in total control, Larry. And, and, and was the reception for that film, uh, I mean, you know, he, he won an Oscar directing himself and, and you won an Oscar nomination at age 18. Was the reception of that film as fantastic as I believe it was? I mean, I hear I, it just must have been, people must have been blown, bowled over. Well, uh, I simply don't know. Um, Shakespeare is not that uh, box office, or d didn't used to be a box office um, sensation. I really don't know, because I certainly didn't uh, think about things like that in those days. I wasn't aware of it. When you got I your... thought what an honor it was to be in it, and also since Wuthering Heights, you know, I, I think every young girl in um, in England certainly, um, you know, had a terrible crush on him because he was so gorgeous. So you were the luckiest girl in the world at that time. I was, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> and what about when you got your uh, uh, your first uh, Oscar nomination? That must have been incredible for you. Or you? Well, I, you know, I thought, oh, whoops, that's nice. You know, <laughs> a Cockney kid from. <laughs> from Cricklewood, as you pointed out. <laughs> you know, I had met Larry Olivier a couple of times, and he was, uh, he seemed like a very nice, good, caring man, and he was, uh, he was a wonderful actor and a wonderful director. Yes. But uh, the next film you did was Blue Lagoon. Wait a minute, I've got one more memory of oh, that. Oh, please. At least I've got a lot, but this one, I was going to kill Larry. I told him that many years later. <laughs> hey, um, uh, my first mad scene which was totally embarrassing and um, for me anyway I was and he, uh, he brought Vivian Vivian Lee down to the set and she sat right by the camera when I was um, trying to play madness and uh, I don't I, I did forgive him for that but it was I was absolutely paralyzed I don't know maybe that was a good thing maybe he did it on purpose that's interesting it's interesting that he would do that so then after that, John, we go to uh, Blue Lagoon after that, I mean... That's right, yes. Um, Do you know I was confused there for a moment? I thought I'd done Blue Lagoon before. Yes. Because I uh, remember having my 18th birthday in Fiji, in the Fiji Islands. Now that's nice. I've never been to Fiji. Yes, it was. Never been out of England before in my life. Never been in an aeroplane. We went by flying boat. <laughs> oh, it was wonderful. The takeoff and the landing alone really is something. Well, yeah, going, moving on from there then, Hamlet, in 1950 you did a film with Dirk Bogard called So Long at the Fair. Yes. Do you have any anecdotes about Bogard? Oh, I, we, we were good friends, good friends. I expected to get married to him, actually. Really? <laughs> <laughs> really? But, uh, didn't go that way. No, I, I guess not. And uh, who else was in the movie? Let me see. Honor Blackman. Honor Blackman, who ended up playing in the first James Bond movie. Remember that? Oh, third, James yes. third James Bond. Third James Bond movie. <laughs> yes, and the wonderful actress Kathleen Nesbitt. Yes. Oh, Kathleen Nesbitt's wonderful. And now yes. you're getting, you know, I mean, now you've, you've been nominated and, and you're really starting to... Uh, you know, get noticed and and starting to uh, to get some uh, to get some roles, which uh, uh, some more roles. I mean, I, geez, I don't know how I can. Well, why did I even say that? Well, Hamlet. How can you do better than Hamlet with Larry okay. Olivia? My partner here is going. What are you talking about, you <laughs> idiot? I can't blame him for that. But well, I, I tell you, uh, I don't know. I didn't. It was just wonderful working, um, and uh, was was of course exciting that that sometimes people would might recognize me. But I think it was my family that, um, or at least certainly my brother, who kept me um, uh, level-headed because his attitude was, oh good, the kid's working. <laughs> and that was the attitude of the family. 
Well, you had a good family behind you. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yes fan- except I had lost my dad by then. No, that's, you know, that's yeah, horrible. So How old were you? When you, uh... When he, when he died, I was 16, yeah. That's just, uh, that's horrible, you know, and he was the... Yeah. You know, I, I had said that, the girl from Cricklewood, and of course that was your dad speaking to you. But, uh... You know, you did a movie, before you did The Robe, you did a movie called Androcles and the Lion. And uh, the director was Chester Erskine. And, I, you know, I have to relate this story because we used to go, Chester Erskine had a house on Trancus. Uh, mm-hmm. And we used to go there, my mom and I. Uh, and I believe he was, uh, it was next door, he was living with Tammy Grimes. And, um, or Tammy Grimes would come over. And I remember my mom was offered to buy the house I think it was in 1967 for $70,000, right on Trancus, right in the Malibu oh. colony. Chester's house, too, and it was, uh, but, but I should mention, and what I haven't mentioned, and I know that our, our fans out there know this, that, that uh, Gene Simmons was and still is absolutely knockout gorgeous. And oh. I, I know you don't, you know, I hope you don't mind hearing that, but as it's very nice. I did like, uh, oh, she was. Uh, no, Hello. she is too. She <laughs> is too. But I mean, you know, you're uh, this Androcles and the Lion. You started to do a couple of uh, kind of, uh, you know, period pieces around that time. But but then then you did the robe with the great Richard Burton, and I can imagine uh, what it was like to work with someone who, as he said really didn't like to make movies and really liked the stage. Yes, no, he didn't. Uh, he hadn't um, sort of adjusted, although he gave a wonderful performance in a, a film he did with Olivia de Havilland. My, my cousin Rachel. Oh, my cousin Rachel, that's right. Yeah, but the thing is, he would say on the set, he said, look, it's, he thought it was easy, film making. He said, look, I can have hysterics, and went off in hysterics. Look, I can do this, look, I can do that. He said, it's all too easy. His attitude was quite wrong. And I think when he married Elizabeth, that um, he really learned that um, movie acting was not not the easiest thing in the world because you do scenes, you know, kind of ask backwards. You do the you can do the middle first and then go back to the beginning, and then go to the end and then pick up stuff in the middle and you know between. And it's not that easy, uh, film uh, film acting. No, definitely not. In that no. sense, it's it's easier in the way in the theater to, um, you know, go from the beginning to the end. I've always... Mind you, um, it's also nerve-wracking in a way, I, w- I would think, because it's um, in front of a live audience. You do have the chance of doing it again, you know, as the director says. Next, you did a movie with Robert Mitchum that Otto Preminger directed. Called. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Any Preminger stories for a young woman? Uh, well, it, you know, I met him, and he couldn't have been more charming. You know, we had dinner, Jimmy Granger and I, and I thought, oh, he seems very nice and European and charming and all that stuff. Got on the set, I, I don't know whether he had to have a somebody that um, he, he could pick on, and I, I, apparently I was the one, and very, very vulnerable. And uh, uh, Robert uh, had to hit me in a scene, and he did the usual thing of, you know, doing the hand, crossing the face, and your neck goes back. And um, it, Otto kept saying, it doesn't look real, it doesn't look real, you've got to hit her. You have to hit her. So I was hit from the long shot to the medium shot to the close-up shot. I was at the end of the day. I think the crew were going to drop a lamp on him. Robert was going to kill him. And um, I had a very sore jaw, I have to tell you. You know, I really, I really, I, I think that <laughs> it's tremendous that, that, that you have such an attitude because I understand, and this may or may not be true, that Howard Hughes had something to do with uh, those in continuing to be hit. Oh, no. <laughs> Good girl. Absolutely not. That's the only thing that Howard Hughes did to, to me was uh, rank, or at least I should say J.R. to rank. I was under contract to him in England. He and Gabriel Pascal sold me to Hughes, my contract, which I had no say in the matter. I don't think you can do that today. Anyway, I, I had to do four films for Howard. And, uh, and you did lose out on Roman, Roman Holiday because of that. Uh, but, yes, he wouldn't let me do it. But you know, that's. But that, then you couldn't get better than Audrey. So, Gene, as far as uh, Angel Face, is that some, a turn you wanted to make in your career, playing somebody just so dark and vicious? Uh, no. Well, I, it was fun to do. Uh, you know, when I was working with Robert, but um, 
um, I, I had no choice. I just had to do what they put me in. I, I, whenever I watch that movie, I'm still amazed how you take Mitchum with you and you kill him at the end too, even though he was oh, really that innocent. Lovely? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we both had to go over the cliff. Yes. That's a <laughs> stunning ending, even today. We're, I don't know if it was a good film. I, 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 I had a problem watching it. Well, it's dark. It's, yes. uh, it's very dark. Well, you work with Mitchum a couple of times. Uh, yes, no, we, we were good friends. He was really, we did a silly picture called She Couldn't Say Yes or She Couldn't Say No, I can't right. remember which it was. But, uh, you know, he was really fun to work with. And then you did, uh, uh, Stanley Donnan did you and Mitchum in uh, The Grass is Greener much That's later. Oh, God, I'd forgotten that, yes. Yeah, Cary Grant and Deborah Carr. But before we get to one of my favorite movies, uh, the actress uh, in 19- Oh, you like that? Uh, I like the fact that George Cukor directed it and then you and Spencer Tracy were in it. And I was wondering what it was like to work with Spencer Tracy. Oh, well, it was heaven. Absolute heaven. And, and, and in fact, it's my favorite time do, shooting movies, really, because it was such fun. We had the luxury of rehearsals in the set and... Um, and to work with him, you know, we, we became great buddies. And the wonderful Teresa Wright and uh, Tony Perkins' first film, yes. Oh, it was heaven. And George was divine. The, the, the funniest thing was that George could play my role much better than I could. <laughs> and um, and it, if he, he went near Spencer to tell him anything. He just said, stay away from me, stay away from me. <laughs> but they worked wonderfully together. Such a joy such a joy. Spencer on the stage was something to behold, I, I can imagine, on, I, on the screen. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, big piece of advice he gave me. He said, just uh, know your lines, kid, and get on with it. <laughs> so I thought, okay, here we go. But uh, I named my daughter after him, Tracy. That's right. Oh. Her name is Tracy. Jean, to stick with your bad girl roles, you and I, I, you were married to Stuart Grange, I think, by the time you did something called Footsteps in the Fog. Did you oh, and yes. Stuart Granger no, choose that? You see, they're much more fun to play in a way, the uh, bad girl. Being the bad girl, huh? Yes. Well, you were both kind fun. of uh, bad in that one. Did you choose that to work together? Uh, well, Jimmy did, mostly. I, uh, you know, he just said, uh, we're going off to do this in England, so anything to get back to London and see my family was great. And she, and um, it, it, it's, it's fun to play bad girls. <laughs> uh, good girls are much more difficult. Because ah. you don't think you're bad. One of my favorite movies of all time, and I, I say this, actually I have a lot of favorite movies, but right after playing The Bad, Bad Girl, your next turn is in the great Guys and Dolls, where you play the good, good girl. Yes. With, yes. Uh, of course, Brando and, and, and uh, you know, Sinatra and, and Vivian, the great Vivian, Vivian Blaine, Blaine yes. Stubby K. Uh, oh, that must have been uh, Joe Mankiewicz directing. That must have been a blast to do. It was. It was. It really was. Especially, you know, with the music going all the time, everybody was kind of hopping around. And we hated it when Joe Mankiewicz said uh, print, because we'd never get to do it again, you know? Yeah. Uh, how was Marlon? I mean, Marlon must have been having so much fun. Oh, he was. I think he really enjoyed it. And uh, also because we had to rehearse the songs, you know, we weren't supposed to do our own singing. But Goldwyn came on the set one day and he listened and he thought, and uh, we were told that we were going to do our own singing. He said, maybe you don't sound so good, but it's you. So, <laughs> so we... Uh, I can imagine, and working with Frank as well. Oh, I didn't really work with Frank. It was only one day I was on the set working. It was the, the last scene in the picture. That's right. It's usually you and uh, you and uh, Marlon. Well, of course, you had done Desiree with Brando a year or two before that. Yes, but uh, he was quite different on that because he was uh, forced to, by contract to do that. It was either that or the Egyptians. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> he chose Desiree, but he really didn't want to, and it's a shame because he would have been a wonderful Napoleon. Uh, but it wasn't written that way. It was about uh, Desiree. You know, it's a shame. But he just was not happy on that. Uh, but on uh, Guys and Dolls, I think he had a blast. Oh, uh, there are stories that Gene Kelly was going to be in that and play it. But then, for some reason, whether they were punishing Kelly, 
it wouldn't lend him out, and that's how Brando got the role. I honestly don't know. I never heard that. Yeah, and I, I can picture Kelly doing it, too. Yes, he could have done. No, oh, absolutely. Of course he could have done. <laughs> he could do anything, that guy. Gene, we're going to take a, a break now, and uh, we'll be back uh, with uh, Gene Simmons on the Icons Radio Hour after this message. Deep within may then shine. Icons Radio Hour invites you to our Monster Mash Halloween party on Sunday, October 28th at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join Stephen Bogart, John Mulholland, and Mayor Ribolo as they trace the origins of movie monsters throughout the years. From Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to Bram Stoker's Dracula, to Hitchcock's Norman Bates, the creature from the Black Lagoon, the Blob, Alien, Hannibal Lecter, Jaws, Freddy Krueger, Scooby-Doo, and many more. Join us for this special show on Sunday, October 28th, as we follow movie monsters throughout the ages. Uh, and welcome back to the Icons Radio Hour. We're having a wonderful conversation with Gene Simmons. And uh, John, you had some questions. Well, I was curious. One of your movies that you did, Gene, was called Until They Sail. With, uh, yes. Uh, was that filmed in New Zealand? No, not one frame. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, because it's got a great feel for uh, the South Pacific. It, it's an it's underrated it movie. Did, yes, I, I didn't see that film. I've never seen it. Is that because um, you were disappointed in it? Oh, uh, that was another contractual thing that I had to do. I didn't mind because I was working with Paul Newman and Joan Fontaine and Piper Laurie. And uh, um, I was I was quite happy on the film. I just um, I think I was disappointed in some of the scenes. I felt yes, I, I just uh, never got around to seeing it. Mind you, I don't see the, any films that I'm in. I don't go to rushes or anything because you always look at the wrong things. Uh, but years later, I can watch it because then I figure it's somebody else <laughs> up there. That's interesting, I, 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 and that's a, uh, it's a personal preference. Do you find that the, most people don't? Oh, yes. Well, I got thrown out of the cutting, um, or the, uh, you know, where they run the rushes. Uh, and I got thrown out by, uh, by uh, Laurence Olivier. He said, I want you to come and see the mad scenes, uh, the mad scene you did. And I said, I don't think so, Larry. He said, no, 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 I want you to see it. He said, I'm very proud of you. Anyway, I started to giggle. <laughs> And uh, and because I, I thought everybody else was going to giggle, and he just threw me out with language I cannot repeat <laughs> on the air. <laughs> and the next time was on Elmer Gantry with Richard, and uh, uh, he said, "I want you to come and see uh, this scene." He said, "I think you know, I'm very proud of you." He said, <laughs> "I said I don't think so, Richard. I don't think so." And he said, "No, no, no, do come." Anyway, I couldn't work for three days after that because I walked funny, I talked funny. And uh, it was just, he said, don't you ever go to rushes again, you know, please don't see them. And I said, I didn't want to. <laughs> but uh, so I got thrown out twice. So there's no point, uh, you know, to, for, I cannot see myself as a third person up there. Some actresses can. Very interesting. And, uh, uh, the next movie you did was one of the finest Westerns I think's ever been made called The Big Country. Uh, William Wyler. Uh, oh, yes. Gregory yes. Peck. Uh, was it fun doing a Western? Oh, yes. And they let me use my own horse, Harry Boy. And, um, no, it was great. It was great. How about working with Gregory Peck? Oh, well, you, you, you know, you don't get any better. Really, it's, um, he was a joy. The, uh, the only problem, I think, was that, that he and uh, William Wyler were having uh, disagreements. And it, that, that got a bit awkward. Because that, he was producing it as well. And that became public on the set that they were having their problems? Uh, well, I, you, you just felt it. You know, they literally were not speaking at times. Well, I read that the big country was a very, very tough shoot physically for everybody. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Where, where, did, where was it shot? In um, Texas or Arizona? No, no, no. Up north in California. And I cannot, uh, I can't recall the, the name. 
the Mojave Desert, you know, that's that's some tough stuff. And uh, out in Stockton and stuff like that. I, I, yes. Very difficult. Oh, Stockton, I think that's it. Yeah, and you know, you worked. That's work, where we are. Look. That's, that's, and, and you worked with uh, also with Charlton Heston, uh, a young Chuck Connors who was the rifleman to all you TV fans. But yes. it, the the movie it just got such such great reviews, and it was yes. just uh, it was. And just of a, course, the music. The music, wonderful film. Yeah, wonderful yeah. Jerome Moreau's score. Yeah. But uh, and Burl Ives, leave us not forget Burl Ives and Charles Bickford. Uh, and and Burl was 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 wonderful because during the um, you know when we were sitting around waiting for the camera to get ready, he did he'd sing a wonderful filthy limericks <laughs> put them to music and uh, oh, no, <laughs> he was simply great and and two years after that you had a trifecta that not many people could match uh, in 1960 Elmer Gantry Spartacus and the grass is greener I mean what a threesome what it a threesome is, it's totally different totally different and Elmer Gantry Another one of my favorite movies. All I see is Burt Lancaster and his smiling face with all those teeth and the. With all those teeth, yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah, just... I, I used to hear Richard say, "Use the teeth, Burt. Use the teeth." <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Directed by Richard Brooks. Yes, yes, indeed. Oh, that was great. That was great. There are stories that uh, uh, it was Burt Lancaster that got Shirley Jones the role that studio didn't want her. I don't honestly know the, that that story. I'm, um, in fact, I believe Richard said to Shirley, after she'd been working a few days, he said, uh, you know, I really was not happy that, um, you know, I, I had another person in mind to play that role, he said. But he said, I do apologize because he said you're going to be, you know, the best in the film. Uh, he was very proud of her. Yeah. And we worked again together uh, uh, yeah, yes. and happy ending. And, yes. and, and no, he adored Shirley, and, and uh, no, he said he said I was thinking on a different direction of who should play. It was offbeat casting. Oh yes, indeed, indeed, and that was what was wonderful about it. And you were the only one who truly believed. I mean, everybody else was a charlatan and a you know yes. a ne'er do well. No, she really, really believed. And and you were the one, you know. She was a bit nuts. Sister mm-hmm. Sharon was was one of the believers. It was a. a one of my favorite movies. I, I mean, I, one of the movies I really remember when I was growing up. Well, it was one of mine too, really, because uh, that's when I fell in love with Richard. That's that's right. That would be Richard Brooks for all. Yeah, our, uh, I knew him before because he used to play um, cards with um, with a group, and uh, and I thought, who is this crazy Russian nut? <laughs> <laughs> he was very funny. Little did you know but what would end up happening. And he was happen. a tiger on the set, of course. Oh, absolutely. And then right yes. right after that, uh, you uh, made Spartacus with uh, Kirk Douglas and, and, and Cooper. Well, I, and then, then I'm not sure because we spent a lot of time, I think, before shooting Spartacus. And then we all went off and did other films. And then we had to go back and shoot some more. Really? So Spartacus a... seemed to go on forever. That's interesting. Was that Kubrick? I mean, Kubrick, uh, initially it was Anthony Mann was, that was directing that. I guess he was then replaced by Kubrick. And uh, I mean, the young Kubrick, how was that to work with someone, you know? Oh, you know, very quiet, um, very, um, this was early Kubrick. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, he had wonderful ideas, wonderful ideas. Yeah. And you're back with Larry Olivier again. As yes, well. of course. I mean, that's... And Charles Lawton. Charles Lawton. Uh, and Kirk and uh, Peter Ustinov. Oh my goodness, what a wonderful John cast. Ireland, Herbert Long, yes. great cast. And then there are stories that Kirk Douglas and Stanley Kubrick didn't get along during the shooting. Oh, good Lord, no. At least I didn't hear anything, and I'm sure I would have if it goes around the set. No, because um, he, d- he did... Um, you see, Spartacus was not Kubrick's kind of cup of tea so to speak. He'd just done the, uh, that other film with um, Paths Kirk. of Glory. Yes, which was brilliant. And um, I, I, I believe that um, Kirk asked Kubrick to um, to help him out, you know, and come and do that Spartacus, which was not his kind of picture, really. But I think it was the best of its kind. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's because I'm prejudiced, but uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. Oh, a great story. 
Kirk yeah. Douglas was great in it, as were you. And then right after that, same year, Grass is Greener, directed yes. by Stanley Don and Cary, mm. Cary Grant, Deborah Carr, and back with Robert Mitchum again. Yes. And that must have been, uh, it must have been nice to get back with Bob and, and uh, you know. With oh, Cary yes, Grant. no, we, we worked very well together. Uh, what was it like working with Cary Grant? It was um, very strange because I knew Cary and Betsy Drake, his then wife. But he seemed to be, um, I, I wasn't really comfortable working with him. It was very odd. Really? In what, in what sense? And of course, you know, this magical, one of the biggest stars in the world, uh, Cary Grant. Uh, it was, uh, uh, I don't know, I had a very strange reaction. That's interesting. It, it doesn't come across that way on screen. You, you well, two are wonderful together. Good. No, it's like, you know, because I like Cary. I liked him very much. But working with him was a different... I, I have to say, it's very strange. I don't understand it myself, to tell you the truth. I, I want to ask you about All the Way Home, um, and I want to ask you about Robert Preston. You know, I remember Robert Preston in The, in the Music Man. Uh, yes. Saw him on Broadway, and uh, directed by Alex Siegel from the James A.G. novel. And mm -hmm. uh, did you enjoy that shoot? I wouldn't say enjoy, because it was um, a very emotional downbeat very downbeat very downbeat um, um, I, I can't use the word enjoy I wanted to do it yes because it's a wonderful story and uh, and uh, and to work with Robert of course yeah no there was uh, Pat Hingle yes 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 Aileen McMahon yes Aileen McMahon was in absolutely John Henry Paul well around the same time you did a movie with Rock Hudson Called this Earth is Mine, <laughs> <laughs> a melodrama, <laughs> to put it kindly. Uh, I'm sorry, just the mention of Brock's name, and I, I start to giggle because we had such, we were terrible on the film because we had we couldn't look at each other because he's a very funny man, Rock, and um, we used to giggle our way. The director must have wanted to kill us both because you know we, we had to see. <laughs> he had to say lines like, um, you've been kissed before, and you liked it, too. And I, I fell apart. <laughs> I, just, I couldn't get... Uh, but there were lines like that in it, the way you had to do it seriously, looking at each other. Well, it was just... <laughs> I'm sorry. You must have been great to work with, i got to tell oh, you. You must heaven. have been a blast. <laughs> Absolute heaven. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Oh, that's... And was loved by cast and crew alike. He was just heaven. <laughs> well, no yeah, wonder yeah. everybody loved you, Gene. I mean, you know. Yeah. What? No wonder everybody loved you with that uh, with that laugh that you have that you've oh. uh, given to us. It's, uh... I'm, I'm sorry about that. No, no. what are you kidding me? <laughs> well, I miss him. I miss him. Uh, um, but anyway, um, yes, okay. Yeah, <laughs> and and you know you started to get into do some TV uh, at that time, and um, and one of the you know I'm jumping ahead, but a couple of things that you did you did the Thornbirds for which you yes. won an Emmy, which was uh, it may still be the most widely received and positively received uh, miniseries ever. A yeah. And you also did uh, Inherit the Wind with uh, Kirk and uh, my stepfather, I guess at the time, or future. Yes, Jason. Jason, yes. absolutely. Jason Robards. Yeah. Working with Jason Robards, I mean, you know, I've seen him and the guy is just, uh, what a spectacular actor. And I, and I wonder what it was like to work with my stepfather at that time. Oh God, no! The the, the trouble with the, your stepfather, Jason, was that uh, I, I I was more inclined to to uh, well, I didn't have many scenes with I didn't have any scenes with. So I could sit there in the courthouse and just watch him, which was heaven to, to you know to watch. He'd do long speeches, and uh, he was just incredible, incredible actor. It was a story about a man who became a tree, and <laughs> that's another one that um, you know. <laughs> It's a bit of a giggle, although I believe it was a wonderful theater piece that he died and wanted to be, be, be a tree when he died. You know, you said that, uh, you know, your voice was, a, you know, you, that you finally got to sing your own stuff, but your voice was certainly good enough to, to be able to tour about 10 years before uh, the Thornbirds in uh, Little Night Music and to sing 
uh, a song that I heard Judy Collins sing, Send in the Clowns. So, yeah. Oh, yes, well, uh, it was more spoken, I think, or, or I don't know what I tried to sing it, but uh, it was, um, you didn't, well, I did sing a bit, yes. Yes, you did. I still remember I'll Know. I was singing it when I came in today before the interview. Well, I couldn't do the Brando part. I could only do your part. <laughs> Gene, you, you did a movie in the mid-60s uh, called Life at the Top. Oh, with, with uh, Lawrence Harvey, yes. Yes, yeah, and Honor Blackman, I think, too. Think yes, yes, Blackman, indeed. Yeah. But it was yes. a sequel to Room at the Top, and I'm not sure I've ever seen a movie that took apart the English class system the way that did. Uh, yes, that was the beginning of that. Yeah, yeah. I just, believe. Um, it wasn't as good as the other one. As Room at the Top. But um, I think it did have something to say. Very much, very much. It, yes. Had you known Lawrence Harvey before that? Oh, yes, I'd met him socially. A very underrated actor. Uh, yes, indeed he was. Indeed he was. And he didn't have time. I, he died very young, didn't he? Yes, yes. Well, I think very young, yes. Yes, in his 40s. Yes. Yes. And then uh, you did another Western in the 60s with uh, Dean Martin. Mm. Rough Night in Jericho. Do you remember yes. that one? Yes, yes, I do. And Dean Martin was oddly the villain in it. He he, he didn't seem natural as the villain. <laughs> no, he was a charmer, absolutely. But this, uh, at least when we did the film, and I uh, played cards with him actually socially, and uh, but he, um, you know, everybody thought he was such a drinker, and he would have a drink brought to him about five o'clock in the evening. And it was like just a little bit of scotch and a great deal of water. And, uh, and, and you know, there was no sign of any um, drinking on the set or anything because he was, I think it was just a big act. It was, that was the persona, huh? Yes. On, on his show, I believe, I watched that a lot. Yes, On his yeah. TV show. And he was terribly funny. He was, uh, that was, he was fun to work with. And then you also did a movie with James Garner, a very strange film called Mr. Indeed. Bird Wing. Yes. Uh, was that a finished script, do you remember, when you started shooting it? I believe so. I believe so. Um, but um, somebody called me up when they saw the film, and they said, can you explain that to me? <laughs> and I said, no, I can't. I simply can't. Well, I was just about I don't, to All ask I know you. is that we had, he had three wives at different ages, and I don't understand, I never did, but I thought it would be fun to do. Yeah, it's, um, a, it's an odd film. It. And of course, he's a joy to work with. Oh, he was fantastic. He, we'll I talk loved about him. underrated actor. I think he's a wonderful actor. Yes. I loved Jim Garner. I, I was down on the set of Health when my mom did Health with him, uh, directed by Bob Altman. And it was a wonderful shoot, and he's such a nice guy. Such yes. a nice guy. Yes, but he's, he's, uh, I think he's a terrific actor. Yeah, I agree. And then you were involved. I was sitting on a Sunday evening watching a football game between the New York Jets and Oakland Raiders. Don't tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> and damn, suddenly Heidi is on. Yes. Listen, I was with a group of um, our friends. We used to play tennis at the weekend. So there were about ten people sitting in uh, with Richard and myself in the den watching the football. And uh, suddenly this happened like it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> and... I, they couldn't talk to me. I had to go and hide in the bedroom. <laughs> I mean, they were so angry. They were so angry. I didn't realize that was you. I, great job, John. I did <laughs> the Heidi game. Oh, well, my God. They blamed me for it, like I pulled the plug. Well, he gave me a very bad reputation, I tell you that. Uh, well, People, I mean, all over the country, the football fan, fan was furious. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Uh, that really is funny. <laughs> and then you, you did Happy Ending, which... Your husband, Richard Brooks, directed. Yes. And he wrote that too? Yes. Did that feel like very personal filmmaking? Yes. Ah. He did it because uh, I had a, um, had a problem uh, with alcohol, and uh, he thought it would help me, which it, it did indeed up to a point. But it was very painful, painful to go through it. 
it, it's a very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a very naked performance on your part, it, it, it just emotionally naked. Well, I've never heard it put that way. <laughs> it, it's really a... Because uh, we kind of got slaughtered for that. Uh, I, I wonder if it isn't just too hitting home. It, it's just... Uh, it's possible because, I mean, uh, it's possible. I don't know because I, I know that the, uh, Richard ran it for the, uh, some producer and their friends and wives. And literally it was like at the end of it when he hesitates. Uh, to, uh, when she asked, would you marry me again? It's like some of them turned to their husbands and says, well, would you? Yeah. And I think it caused a bit of problems. Uh, I can believe that. It, it's an extremely... Uh, it, I, I wonder if, if it were to be revived or taken up today again, that it wouldn't have a different reception. I honestly don't know, because it's, it's really... I, would, I would, should imagine the style is very old-fashioned now the way movies are shot yeah. and uh, your although they do, do deal with the many problems you know well your performance is an old fashioned it's uh, it's bare it, uh, and thank well, you I for it I it was a bit close to home yes in a way but it, it um, I, I really believe Richard did that to see if he could help my problem uh, which it did in, in a certain way but uh, it's funny it's uh, thinking back on it yes it was really painful to do. Anyway, on to happier things. <laughs> on to happier things. Such as Divorce American Style? Oh, that was with Jason? Yes, I yes. love that movie. I yes. love that movie. Yes. That was the one, the opening scene when he's in bed with, uh, I forget who he's in bed with, and his wife walks in, and you see Jason and the woman making up the bed, and why? what's going on? What's she doing here? Oh, there's no one here. There's no, I'm, I'm just saying, there's no one here. No, everything's fine. No. Woman, why? It was the greatest opening. I love that movie. I absolutely do. <laughs> i tell you why I did that. Um, I had um, sort of semi-retired in my mind. I'd, I got married, to, we were married, and uh, I retired, I thought. Um, Stay-at-home wife. I did the cooking for Richard, and uh, about a year later, Richard sat me down and he said, look, um, why don't you go back to what you know what you're doing? And he said, we'll hire a cook. I think the poor man was starving to death, <laughs> or being terribly kind and polite. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> and that was the first film I did after, in my mind, retiring. That's true. So, um, well, you yeah. haven't... <laughs> You haven't retired yet, have you? Well, not really, no. I, I went over to England to do a film called The Wreck, and, uh, which I loved doing very much. Um, and uh, it's a story about a family with their problems. Oh, great. When's it coming out? I don't know. I still have some looping to do on it, if there's any... If there is any, I'm just waiting to hear. Ah, looping. Well, you know, I'll tell you, Gene, this has been great, and I'd like to leave you with one little story that I read about you. I uh -oh. believe that nah, it's a good one. I believe that you're one of the the only woman who can say that she knocked that she hit Jack Dempsey and Jack Dempsey backed off. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just tell us about that story before well, we go? No, uh, he, uh, um, uh, Jimmy knew him because he was a great boxing fan. And he said, because Gene had to do a, a knockout punch in Guys and Dolls. And he said, would you come up and help her? So he came up and, uh, and uh, he taught me you know, how to do the bag, hitting the bag. Yeah. Uh, the, the little one that wobbles. Yeah. Not the big bag. The, uh, yeah, the whatever it is. Whatever. And, um, and then he it, it, you know, trained me to, to, to throw a good punch. And if anybody did get in the way, I was quite strong then of tennis and all that stuff and um, <laughs> yes uh, Jack Dempsey taught me how to fight how right about that? and he said he said uh, let me see how you hit and you hit him and he backed up a little bit <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> that really he was being kind I think <laughs> oh I'm sure he was I'm sure yes. he was <laughs> Gene you know I really want to thank you for coming on our show uh, is well, there anything you. else thank you'd you like to talk about I mean I'm sure when we hang up I'll think of umpteen things. I thought, I wish I had said that. Why didn't I say that? Well, and why did I stutter so much? And 
all that you stuff have it go at all. You haven't at all. I can't think of anything at the moment. You have been fantastic, Jean, and uh, I really want Not to Not like pulling you. teeth? Not like Not pulling at teeth at all. As I said, okay. you were great. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to spend with us. And thank you very much from all of us here at Icons thank Radio. You, thank you, John. Thank you so much, Jean. It's been a pleasure. Thank Bye. you. You've been listening to the Icons Radio Hour with Stephen Bogart and John Mulholland. Join us every Sunday evening at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another exciting edition of Icons Radio Hour. Now you can take your Icons Radio Hour mobile by downloading current and archived shows utilizing the RSS stream button on the Icons Radio Hour homepage or visit our podcast at the iTunes store at apple.com. Good night. Thank you.